Hello, I'm Megan Humphrey. I'm the Executive Director of HANDS, and we are a nonprofit in Burlington, Vermont, whose mission is to get food to seniors who are lower income. So we have a number of programs, including this one, our Hands in the Dirt, and we partner with um, the very famous Charlie Nardozzi and Vermont Community Garden Network to bring gardening programs. Um, we have Hands in the Kitchen, which is a uh, nutrition education workshop series as well. And we're already shockingly gearing up to um, distribute, to deliver um, about a thousand meals and gift bags all over the county on Christmas. So we have a lot going on. And we have also partnered with Heineberg Senior Center to do the Support Buddies program in response to COVID. So those are our other programs. And we wanted to especially thank AARP Vermont, CCTV, Town Meeting TV, Gardener Supply, Hannaford, and Red Wagon Plants for all of their support for all of these programs. Um, and I wanted to point out once again, I have Marie Davis um, Peapod earrings on, which is kind of fun. She's a local artist. And um, as Charlie knows, I love August more than any other month. Um, but suddenly we're talking about fall in today's series. And then we have one more on September 15th about putting food by for the winter. So Charlie, thank you so much for once again coming and here you go. Well, thank you very much, Megan. Uh, it's always great to be here. Uh, let's see, I just want to do that. There we go. Uh, yes, so welcome. And yes, it is August. It kind of creeps up on you, doesn't it? You look at the calendar and all of a sudden, oh my God, it's August. Uh, and there's lots more things to do, but it is a very bountiful month in the garden. I know our gardens are doing really well with lots of produce coming in, uh, lots of berries. We have a lot of berry bushes and, and fruit trees. Um, and lots of flowers too, we're getting into those fall flowers. So what I wanted to talk about though is not so much harvesting in this uh, little talk, uh, but I wanted to talk more about what to do to keep the harvest going. So uh, that would include things you could have planted perhaps in the spring that would be long season crops that you're gonna actually be harvesting in the fall and, and into oh, maybe even to early winter, uh, but also things you can do now. Uh, that will help you get the garden uh, growing and get some new plants uh, planted and, and growing so that you can enjoy that bountiful harvest into September, October, and November. Uh, so without further ado, let me share my screen and we will get going with this whole talk on fall gardening. Okay, so the fall vegetable garden. You know, a lot of us uh, started out gardening with the idea that uh, you know, we plant things in May, plant things in June, and then we kind of just let it do its course, you might say, and really don't think about continually planting throughout the season. I know in previous uh, talks that I've given for hands uh, this season, I've talked about succession planting, you know, continually planting things right through the summer so you have more in late summer and fall. But now is a good time to kind of get that last gasp, that last <laughs> big planting in uh, before it gets a little too late. Uh, for things to mature in the fall. And there are a lot of options. And that's really what I want to highlight with this talk and really kind of give you some ideas that as things kind of fade, you know, the beans kind of fade or the squashes, summer squashes start fading and cucumbers, uh, plants like that, instead of just pulling them out or cutting them back and cleaning out the bed, uh, you can do that for sure. And you may want to do that, uh, but also take that as an opportunity to plant something else in that bed. And the something else will be what we'll be talking about here. But before we go there, I wanna talk a little bit about harvesting some of those uh, summer crops that are really pushing along with our warm, humid weather, wet weather that we've had. A lot of things like the melons, for example, have been uh, moving along really quickly. And often people have questions about when to harvest them. So when we're talking about cantaloupes or melons. Uh, it's really a simple crop to harvest. The, the best way to know when to harvest them is you lift them up. And when they slip off the vine, literally they just slip right off the stem, that means they're ripe. Another thing I always do is I give them a sniff. You just sniff the blossom end of them. And if they smell like a ripe melon, you know it's a ripe melon. Another thing, of course, you can do is watch and see what the wildlife is doing. If you've got squirrels or mice and voles interested in your melons, you know they're probably ripe. So you want to pick them. 
the thing you do uh, want to do is let them ripen on the vine. These are not the kinds of fruits that will continue to ripen, you know, like some of our other fruits that we have. These will not continue to ripen after they've been harvested. So if you do have problems, say, with pests like mice and voles and squirrels, you might want to put a little wire cage around some of your prize melon just so you can protect them so they don't get hollowed out uh, while they're sitting there trying to ripen. Watermelons um, also are maturing nicely. We've got some nice ones in our garden. They're putting on some size now. Um, and these are a little harder to know when to harvest these because uh, watermelons uh, will not slip right off the vine when they're ripe. So you're gonna have to use some other cues. Now, some people will look at the bottom of a watermelon and when that bottom that's usually kind of white, you know, the bottom is uh, on the soil surface, uh, that area on the skin is usually white. When it turns kind of a yellowish color, they use that as an indicator. Some people will thump them, they literally thump them with their fingers. And it, when it has more of a hollow sound, that tends to uh, tell people that it's time to harvest. But really the, fail, the most uh, easiest way and the most foolproof way of telling if your melons are ripe is looking at the tendrils. So when you look at this image I have up there now, you could see if you go to the right, maybe about one o'clock or so on that screen, you could see a little shoot coming out, little curly cues coming hanging out there. Those are tendrils. That's a tendril that comes out of the vine. That's usually what it uses to grab hold of things. When that tendril closest to the watermelon starts to brown and fade, that's an indication your watermelon is ripe and ready to harvest. So that's really the, probably the best way to know when to harvest your watermelons is waiting for those tendrils to turn brown. If you wait too long and they get really brown, then your watermelon's gonna start cracking and kind of be kind of mealy. If you pick it too early, well, we've all done that probably in the past. It's kind of green and doesn't really have that flavor you're looking for. Winter squash, um, they're a little bit easier than watermelon because they turn a certain color when they're ripe. So you get, for example, butternut squash. And uh, most of the varieties of butternut squash are gonna turn this kind of brownish color. When they turn that color, that mature color, then you know that you can harvest them or you can even just leave them in the field or leave them in the garden. They're okay just sitting there. As long as they don't get hit by a hard frost, they'll be fine as far as storage goes. Now, some of the new varieties of winter squash, the acorn squash and the turban squashes and all of those, um, they mature to all different kinds of colors from white to green uh, to black to red. So sometimes it's a little hard to know what the mature color should be for that. So another thing you can do with your winter squash is take your thumb and just press it, press your thumbnail onto the, the skin of the winter squash. And if you can press your thumb onto it and you get some resistance, meaning that it doesn't easily pierce the skin, then it's probably ripe and ready to harvest. But like I said, most of these winter squash can just be left out in the garden. And as long as they don't get zapped by a cold frost, they'll be fine out there. And then you can harvest them at your leisure. That's a nice thing about them. Another thing you wanna do with your, any of these cucurbits, so melons and squashes, for example, is this time of year, it's good to really encourage the fruit that is already set to size up and ripen. So you wanna stop the plants from creating new vines that have new flowers and new fruit because those new flowers and fruits are not gonna have enough time to mature. So this time of year, it's good to go out to your melon patch or your winter squash patch or your pumpkin patch and just snip off those little shoots. So that little shoot there you see at the end, just go back maybe three or four inches or so, snip off the flowers and the little fruits on it so that you can see those other fruits that have set off to the left there, they're gonna have a chance to fill out. In fact, that one vine, that's probably about, well, about seven o'clock, I guess, on your screen, you can see that there's a little fruit there and then at the end of it, there's another flower. I would snip off that flower and just let all the energy go to that fruit so you can get a big size fruit that matures before frost happens. Now, tomatoes are, are pretty simple. You know, they're starting to come. They're a little slow this year, at least in our garden. Uh, I know the farmer's markets are loaded with tomatoes, but often a lot of the local farmers now use hoop houses, which helps them get a jump on the season and also helps them get a harvest of tomatoes a lot earlier. Uh, but they will come along. You know, we're still in August. We've got plenty of time for tomatoes and we'll have lots of them in the next few weeks. Uh, so the thing, of course, with tomatoes is that regardless of which variety you go, and these are a whole bunch from, from our garden a couple of years ago, you can see all the different heirlooms, different colors, different shapes and sizes. Regardless of the variety you're growing, you wanna make sure it starts coloring up before you harvest it. So this is really more of a tip for um, into September and October where you have some green tomatoes still out there and there's threats of frost coming. So can I harvest it and bring it indoors to ripen? And the answer is, if you have some color on that fruit, yes, you can. You can bring it inside. A lot of people will wrap it up in a, uh, individual fruits into a newspaper, uh, put it in a warm, dark place, doesn't need light. 
It just needs warmth and it will continue ripening so that you'll have that nice tomato flavor, maybe even October, November, depending on how many green tomatoes you have. If the green tomatoes have not shown any indication of color, they will not ripen indoors. So it's best to harvest those and fry them up as green tomatoes or pickle them or do something with that with them. So just like the pinching of the cucurbits, you can pinch tomatoes too, but you don't wanna do that quite yet. Now, if you have some of those uh, big heirloom varieties, like some of the ones I just showed you there, um, those you might start thinking maybe the end of the month, starting to pinch the tops of the, of the plants. And the idea with pinching the tops of the plants is just like with the cucurbits, you're trying to send more energy into the existing fruits to get them to ripen in time. Uh, so you can just pinch the tops off. So the fruits that are there, that are you know, just starting to size up, looking like a good size, they'll still have enough time to get to full maturity and ripen for you. The exception to this would be cherry tomatoes. So if you have cherry tomatoes, you do not wanna pinch those vines by the end of August because that's still too soon. They are very prolific, they grow very fast and they only have small little fruits to mature. So I would wait till mid, even end of September to pinch the vines of those cherry tomatoes. That way you can get the maximum amount of production from them before a frost comes. This time of year, it's good to make a new bed. And this is kind of the traditional way of making beds, right? You get the rototiller out there or you get the shovel out there and you start digging up the sod and tilling it all under and doing that. But let me introduce you to a new way of doing it. And I actually talked about this in a previous uh, presentation that we did, I think probably in the spring, and that's called no dig gardening. And no dig gardening really uses a tenant that we should be imitating what's happening in nature. And this idea of tilling the soil and turning the soil every year is actually not a good thing for your soil, for the plants, and for the wildlife that's involved in it. Because we found out that in a teaspoon of soil, there's over 4 billion microbes. And those microbes are in there creating, basically creating relationships with plants, with plant roots. And one of the most famous ones, of course, are the mycorrhizae fungi. And what they do is that they create this symbiotic relationship where they're working together so that the mycorrhizae lives on the roots. And what the mycorrhizae do is open up those roots so they can bring in more water and nutrients and your plants grow better. So this is a whole sophisticated system that's happening under the soil. And every time you till the soil, you break up that system so it has to recreate itself. So a better way to garden, especially if you're starting a new garden, whether it be on a lawn like this or just in an a weedy area or just expanding an existing garden is to do a no dig system. And, and this is how no dig works. What you wanna do if you have a lawn or even a weedy area, mow it down close to the ground, you know, kind of scalp the grass down and then lay about four to six layers of a newspaper on it. And we're using like seven days here, for example. Uh, seven days is great, <laughs> works really well for uh, smothering out the grass. You don't have to worry about the colored ink on the page. Uh, because that's fine, uh, but you don't want to use glossy paper. So sometimes they have glossy inserts. You don't want to use that. By putting about a four to six inch thick layer and watering it down so it doesn't blow away, what that do is it does is smother that grass, kills the grass, but preserves all of that soil biological life that's under there and all the humus that's there, all the real rich soil that's there right underneath the surface of the roots of those grasses. Then on top of that, we're going to put a six to eight inch thick layer of hay or straw I like to use hay because it's uh, cheap and easy to find, but straw is fine too. Chopped leaves would be fine too. And then on top of that, we're putting a two to three inch thick layer of compost. And so if you do this in the fall, which is, this is an extension of uh, one of our gardens we did a number of years ago um, that, that we did in the fall. By the spring, this is all broken down enough so that you can literally plant right through it and plant your plants right in it. So if you're doing this for a new garden, whether it be a vegetable garden or a flower garden, now is a great time of year to do this, to mark out that area, uh, mow it all down, lay down the newspaper, the hay, the straw, the organic materials, make a nice thick layer, just leave it there and then cap it with compost. Uh, sometimes what we'd, I'd like to do also is cap the compost with a little more hay, just so the compost doesn't get eroded away in the winter. And, and that's a great system to kind of set up now. Uh, if you have really tenacious weeds in the area where you're going, so you have goldenrod that comes up or uh, wild raspberries, then you might you want to use cardboard instead of that uh, newsprint that I was talking about. But the cardboard you want to use is the corrugated cardboard. You don't want to use paperboard. You don't want to use like cereal boxes, for example. You want to use the boxes that you would get when you buy an appliance or some of those corrugated boxes. Of course, strip off all of the plastic that's around it, all of any metal staples, 
um, any things like that that are not going to decompose and lay down a layer of that. And then you build on top of that with the organic materials and then the compost. The, the uh, cardboard will take a little bit longer to break down, but that's okay because if you do it now, you've got a good six months or so before you're going to start gardening. So by the spring, you'll probably be able to use it. So once you have your bed, then you want to plant. And yes, you can still plant things this time of year in late August. Uh, we're planting fall veggies. And so what kind of things you want to grow? Well, anything that's green. Well, literally anything that's leafy green. Uh, lettuces, spinach, kale, Swiss chard, mescaline mixes, any of those uh, will work really well this time of year. The reason is, even if they only grow a little bit and you get a little small plant, you can eat it because you're eating the leafy greens of it. So these are plants that are adapted uh, to the cool temperatures and they do okay with the short day lengths. And that's really gonna be a limiting factor very soon here as we get into September and October. Uh, so that's why it's important to get these in the ground soon so you can get them up and growing before the, the days get really short. Beets, radishes, and baby carrots are even a possibility. The beets, of course, even if you don't get a beet, you can eat the beet greens. Radishes are very fast growing, everyone knows that. And baby carrots are worth a try. If you have a, a protected spot that gets a lot of sun, you might try a little baby carrot, or maybe you have a raised bed, one of those elevated raised beds or a container. Um, you might get some little baby carrots, you know, like the Thumbelina carrots or the baby fingers, little ones, little fingers, uh, before the, the cold and the short days really stops their growth. And then Asian greens, everything from bok choy to mizuna to mabuna. There's lots of different types of Asian greens out there, the mustards. Um, again, you're eating the leafy greens of them. So even if they're a small plant, they'll be worth growing. So when you're planting lettuce and greens, I usually say if you can plan ahead, and this is probably a little late to try to do this now, but if uh, we were doing this say in the end of July, I'd say start them from seed indoors or in a patio or on a deck or somewhere and get a little seedling going. So once you have a little seedling going, then three weeks or so later, you can transplant that out. That's gonna give you a kind of a jump on the season, but also it's gonna help the plant because you know, this time of year, there's a lot of insect pressure. There's a lot of insects out there ready to munch on things. You might have rabbits or, and mice and other kinds of critters running around your garden. Um, if a little seedling pops out of the ground and gets munched on by someone, it's gonna die pretty quickly. But if you have a, a transplant like this, it's probably gonna be able to survive especially if you can protect it a little bit and grow into a nice size plant. Of course, this time of year, it might be getting a little late to be doing this. So you're probably gonna to have to just direct sow seeds as we get towards the end of August. And that works really well for things like spinach. Um, I get spinach, you can just do a, what I call a broadcast seeding. So you have a little spot on your bed, maybe a one foot by one foot diameter spot. You excavate the soil, push it aside a little bit, sprinkle all the spinach seed in there, cover it back over, water it and just let it go. Um, spinach will germinate really well in cool temperatures. Um, it grows up really fast and you can start eating it as a baby spinach or you can overwinter it. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. Arugula is a really nice green to grow because it really tolerates cold temperatures. So if you can get your arugula up and growing now, you know, one of the things people have a problem with arugula, with arugula in the spring is that it tends to get a little bitter, especially when it gets warm. Uh, but when you're growing it in the fall, you don't get those hot temperatures so much. Uh, so it can continue to grow and you can just leave it in the garden and harvest it as you need it and have that nice crisp taste to it. Radishes are really quick uh, growing and really fast growing plant. Easy to seed these now. Within 20, 30 days, usually you'll get a radish to eat. Because we're going into the fall though, you have to remember the days are, are continuing to get shorter and shorter. By September, our days are the same day length as they are in March. So that's going to slow down the growth of plants. So your radishes that normally are ready in 20 days, they might take 40 or 50 days. So putting them in now will guarantee that you'll have them by the end of September. Um, and kale, you know, these are kale plants that uh, were planted in the spring. This is kind of how we grow kale. Uh, it's called red boars, this variety, really beautiful and, and tasty variety. Um, but the uh, way we grow kale is to plant it in the spring, let it grow up, protect it from cabbage worms and things of that nature. By this time of year, we've got plants that are two or three feet tall, loaded with leaves, and then we won't start eating them until September, October. So you can grow kale that way, or you can grow it from seed starting now. And again, it'll be a little plant that'll have tender leaves and really nice one to grow, um, even for like salads. So there's a lot of those leafy greens and some of those root crops that you can grow that'll really be a nice ones to start 
Uh, but the key is to get out there like this weekend, if you can, and plant some of these things. Find a spot where you can clean out some old plants, put some compost down, sow these plants in there, even check garden centers. They might still have some things like some of these uh, leafy greens that are, are still in stock so that you can uh, take some of those and pop them in. Plants like cauliflower, cabbage, um, and broccoli, um, it's too late to start those from seeds. It's almost too late to even put the transplants in at this point. They really should be in the ground by more like the end of July or so, or early August, um, to get that nice fall crop of those. It's a great crop to grow, and I always grow cauliflower and cabbage for the fall because those shorter days allow you to leave the plant out there longer without having to worry about it bolting or cracking or anything. Um, but you do have to plan for it. So I always will, will put that in maybe right after a really early crop of something, you know, some lettuces or something like that that have gone by and they're done by end of June. Then after that, I'll start moving some of these fall crops into the garden. So that's what you need to do right now. So there's a little push happening. Then there'll be another little push for planting in October. And that's to plant garlic. Everybody loves garlic, right? Um, but you want to plant this the same time you're planting tulips and daffodils. So generally mid-October in the Champlain Valley, Connecticut River Valley, maybe even a little earlier up in the Northeast Kingdom and in the mountainous areas. There are two different types. There's a soft neck garlic that you use uh, often you see braided like this, the New York white is one of those varieties. And you do want to get varieties that are, are, have names to them that are adapted to our climate. You don't want to just go out to the grocery store and buy whatever is in the grocery store because those tend to be California varieties that don't really mature very well here. So soft neck varieties, you can braid. They have very supple leaves. They're really nice to have. Um, you can put them in a kitchen like this, really sweet to, to cook with. Um, or there are hard neck varieties, and these have those scapes that you probably have seen in farmers markets or in people's gardens. And that's the flower shoot, basically. The scapes are edible. In fact, we make scape pesto usually every year, which is really intense because it's a lot of garlic flavor. Uh, but that is just a sign that that garlic is getting ready to mature. You do want to remove those scapes, whether you eat them or not, because that will send more energy into the garlic bulb getting bigger. Generally, the difference between the soft neck garlic and a hard neck garlic is that the soft neck tends to have more cloves, but maybe a little bit smaller size. The hard neck varieties like the uh, Romanian red and a number of other ones, uh, they tend to have larger cloves, but fewer of them. It's really kind of a preference. And the nice thing about garlic is that you can save some every year when you harvest it in July, which is what we've done. And you can take out the biggest cloves, you know, the nicest ones you have, save those aside. And those are the ones you plant in October. And the more you do that, you kind of create your own variety almost that's adapted to your climate, your weather, your conditions. And I've done that with uh, other plants and I've gotten you know, like really large bulbs that way. Um, elephant garlic, speaking of large gold bulbs, this is one that people tend not to grow much, but it's a lot of fun. Uh, it literally is, big, is as big as the palm of your hand. Um, but you think, oh my God, that must have such a strong flavor with those just one clove, but it doesn't. It's a very mild flavor. It's actually related more to leeks than garlic, but it forms a garlic bulb. Um, so that's a fun one to grow if you want kind of a mild garlic flavor and you want a lot of garlic. I would really do that. Uh, when you're planting garlic, again, you got to find a bed. So by October, though, it's a lot easier to find a bed to clean out because everything's kind of going by or been hit by frost. Um, and then once you clean the the plants out there, and I would suggest if those plants are healthy, I would just chop them and, and not pull out the roots. Again, trying not to disturb the soil, which is one of the, the tenets of no-dig garden. Uh, so try just to chop them off and maybe chop them into pieces. I talk about chop and drop them a little bit um, or remove them if they're diseased. Um, and then come in with a layer of compost right on top of the bed and then pop in your garlic, spaced about six inches or so apart, a couple inches deep into the soil bed. A uh, really simple thing to do if you build, if you grow them in a raised bed, you'll see that you have very few problems with them. I have rarely had problems with my garlic. The only time I did, I remember, uh, is when I tried to plant them right directly in the ground, not in a raised bed, and we had a really kind of wet winter, a lot of rain, that kind of thing, and they rotted. Um, but other than that, I've never had problems with garlic. So one of the easier crops to grow. And by spring, they start coming up. You give them a little fertilizer, keep them weeded, watered. By July, you're harvesting them. Now, shallots is another bulb that's kind of like garlic that a few people really grow as a fall crop, but I grow it as a spring and fall crop. It's kind of fun. Uh, so I will plant some of my shallots, um, which are like a mild onion. They're small, very famous in French cooking in particular. Uh, I pop those in with the garlic. Um, this fall and then next spring they'll, they'll grow up and they actually mature a little 
sooner than the garlic will mature. And you can tell when they're ready, they'll just kind of break apart you know, and you'll see the individual bulbs like these. Um, pull those out and clean them up and keep them. But I also then plant again in the spring. Um, so I have a fall crop that matures in the spring and then a spring crop that's gonna be maturing very soon. That way we have a bunch of shallots for winter. And these are great. They last a long time in storage and they have that nice mild flavor. And this is a crop that I've been saving uh, year after year from replanting the biggest one. So now I get some that are like the size of small onions, which makes them really much easier to peel and use. Once you have all your shallots and your garlic planted for fall, then you wanna cover them up. And you, you can do this early after you're done planting, or you can wait. I usually wait till November or so, uh, throw some hay or straw over the top of it. Here I rigged up a little thing with uh, Velcro plant ties <laughs> and some boards just to hold the hay in place. But you can use uh, a covering or some boards just placed on top of it. Just leave it there all winter long. Come spring when you start seeing signs of growth, that's when you remove the mulch and you let them start growing. So there are also vegetables that you can hold. So we talked, I've talked about <clears throat> harvesting summer vegetables. They've talked about which ones you can plant now, um, but they're also thinking next year, what vegetables can you actually plant that you don't have to do anything to, and then by the fall, that's when they come into their full glory. Leeks are definitely one of those. So we plant leeks every year in the spring, the little spindly little shoots, pop them in, I cover them over to keep the leek moth, which I have in our garden. Uh, keep that away from them and just let them grow and let them grow. Keep them watered, weeded, that's it. And then by September, October, we got these beautiful uh, blue Soleil, is a variety we grow, uh, and Tandor is another one, uh, leeks that are ready to harvest. And leeks are great because I've literally gone out in November, December, harvested a frozen leek, brought it inside, chopped it up, made a leek soup out of it, and it was, it was great. So there are the kind of uh, what I call plant it and forget about it crops until the fall comes and then you can start enjoying it. The same thing is true of Brussels sprouts. So as long as you can keep them healthy and growing well, and we grow these under covers too, because we have a Swede midge, which is another insect that likes the brassicas. Uh, so uh, we keep them growing there. I just checked them the other day and they're just forming their little sprouts all along the stem. And so they will continue to do that right into September, October. And then once it gets, the days get shorter and they can't really grow much anymore, they'll just hang out there. They'll just wait there. And I've literally gone out again in, in December and harvested Brussels sprouts um, even if they were frozen a little bit and they still taste pretty good. I often get the question from people is that what happens if you get into September and your little sprouts are not forming along the stem, these little Brussels sprouts? Well, at that point, what you probably wanna do is top the plant, just cut off the top four to six inches of the plant. That just like pinching the tomatoes or pinching the cucumber or the uh, melon vines is gonna send more energy into maturing those Brussels sprouts that you have along the stem. You don't wanna do it yet. We're still only in August. So there, there's still time for them to form more sprouts up the stem. But if you get into early to mid September and nothing is happening, and you look all the way down to the bottom of the stem and nothing's happening, then you wanna to top it. Carrots, you can uh, certainly plant in earlier in the season. And when they mature, you can hold them in the soil. You can hold them in a raised bed. You do have to watch out of course for mice and voles, but uh, carrots are not that hard to really hold through the winter if you mulch them heavily. So putting a couple foot thick layer of hay mulch on top of them, say in October or so, then you can go out through the winter, just pull the hay mulch back, pull the snow back and just pop out those carrots. As long as the ground doesn't freeze, they'll be delicious. If the ground freezes, then when it thaws, those carrots are going to start rotting. Now you can do a little bit of that with beets, but they're not as uh, hardy, I would say, as the uh, carrots are. So what I've done with those is I just try to harvest them before you get a real uh, cold frost. You know, a light frost is okay with beets, but when the ground starts freezing a little bit, they just kind of turn to mush. But parsnips do not. And that's another one that you in fact want to grow uh, through the season, let them grow in the fall. I don't even cover ours. I just leave them there until the spring, till March or April when the ground starts thawing. Then I go out there and I dig them out and that's when they taste the best because they've sweetened up. Their, their starches have turned to sugar through the winter and they're very sweet. They caramelize really well. Um, and sometimes they get huge. <laughs> That's one problem I've had with them is I forget them out there and, I, and some of them get like the size of like a, a turnip almost. Um, they're kind of woody like that. So it's best to harvest them when they're smaller. If you want to harvest in the fall, you can, but just make sure you wait till October, November after they've had a number of cold nights, maybe frosty nights to really become much sweeter roots. 
And then overwintering spinach. I mentioned I was going to talk a little bit about this. So if you've planted your spinach now, you'll notice that it'll grow up, um, but it'll stop growing probably in September sometime when the days get too short for it. Um, so what you can do at that point is you can cover it up. And spinach is a really hardy crop and all you really need, sometimes you don't need to cover it depending on the winter, but just for insurance, it's good to cover it, is to put a floating row cover over it. So there's a floating row cover over actually some bok choy, not spinach. Um, and there's three different weights of the floating row cover. That's this poly spun um, fabric that's, that you can see right there that you can get locally in a lot of different places. There's a lightweight version, which is really for more for insect control, it keeps the bugs from coming in, laying eggs and all that kind of stuff. That's not gonna give you any frost protection. Then there's the regular weight, which is what this is. That's gonna give you frost protection probably down to about 28 degrees. So that's good for the shoulder season, spring and fall, just as uh, we're getting some frost, maybe some cold nights, but not really chilly nights. And then there's the one we have on the left here, which is the winter blanket. And literally you can't even see through it. That's how thick it is. It's like a piece of fleece almost. That'll protect your plants down to 24 degrees. So that's something you probably wanna put on say September, October to try to stretch whatever you're growing, whether it be spinach into next spring or even some of these crops that I've mentioned, have them there um, and protect them through the winter. You can also use a cold frame. The one there is an old one I created at my old home. Um, I think I did that one for maybe $30. <laughs> I got some scrap lumber. I got some uh, PVC tubing, uh, piping there, some plastic, um, put it together. And that works really well, again, on those shoulder seasons. It's not going to protect plants when they get down into the low 20s, but certainly into mid to upper 20s, it, it does fine. Um, and that talks about, you know, the idea of a cold frame, you know, having a nice cold frame, you can really design it out with some window panes and things. Um, it's a good way to protect your plants in the fall and to use that as a space for planting to have some nice greens right into the fall and early winter. So I just want to wrap it up with a, a little bit of fall garden cleanup too, uh, because that's also what we'll be doing very soon. And in fact, you could be doing it all along, as I, like I, remember, uh, I mentioned. Um, as things kind of slow down and start dying back in our garden, I often will go through and just kind of chop them out, bring some compost in and plant something else. I'm always having something growing in the soil, either having mulch on the soil to protect it or having something to grow. It could be even a cover crop, but that's an important tenant of no-dig gardening. And I mentioned chop and drop earlier. So what I do with plants, say like this broccoli plant there, if, it's, if it wasn't heavily diseased or insect infested, what I will do is I'll go in with my hedge trimmers and just chop it all down when it's done, when it's, I'm kind of done with it and it's done with me. I chop it all down into little pieces, just leave it there as a mulch. And then in the spring, I come back and a lot of that is decomposed. I just throw some compost over it and plant right through it. Now this could be a little dicey if you like a nice clean garden. Um, but if you're okay with little messiness, with little stumps here and there from the broccoli stalks um, or some of those stems that didn't decompose completely, um, you can clean them up in the spring a little bit. Sure, that's fine. But you don't want to disturb the soil. That's really the whole idea behind this. And it protects the soil in the winter from erosion, from wind and rain and snow and all those things. Um, and it protects those microbes. That's really what we're trying to protect is the microbes in the soil. So you're creating a rich environment that you can just plant into next spring. And you can add some uh, compost. So as I was talking, as we go along, every time you're planting something, you wanna add a little compost before you do it. That's another tenant of the no-dig gardening system. And you can add mulch. So say you have a bed of tomatoes that were heavily diseased and you don't wanna leave those there. So you chop them off of the ground, leave the roots in intact, and then you can come in with hay or straw or leaves or whatever it is, and just put that right on that bed. That's gonna protect it. In fact, you can do that over a whole area here. Our dog Linus is showing us this. This is our potato patch area. And so what we do here is that after we're done uh, pulling the potatoes out, and literally we don't plant potatoes, we just kind of put them on the ground and then bury them in, in hay mulch. Uh, we bring in some more hay mulch in the fall. So any part of our garden that is not gonna be, um, have a cover crop on it or a crop that's going into winter or chop and drop crop, it has hay mulch on it. Um, but you can use leaves, you can use untreated grass clippings, you can use straw, you can use a variety of things to protect that soil in the winter. And what you're doing also is you're building up the fertility of that soil at the same time. So hopefully this gives you some ideas of what you wanna do with your fall gardens. One thing I forgot to mention that I'll just mention here at the end are some of the plants that you can literally bring indoors too. So plants like parsley, for example, or maybe you have a potted hot pepper that you really love. 
these plants are not really going to thrive indoors, but you can bring them indoors come September, October to avoid a frost, put them in a sunny window, and continue to harvest them um, right up until they're done or the, the plants are just kind of wilted. And usually that would happen sometime um, in November, December, but maybe you could use them for the holidays, which would be really nice to be able to say, oh yeah, those are my hot peppers in that dish. So the ones that are right in the window over there. So hopefully all this gives you some ideas and inspirations on how to do some fall gardening. So let me come back here and thank you all for coming. I appreciate your time and I appreciate you uh, watching all this and hopefully you got some good tips on what to do this fall, what to plant, how to plant them, when to plant them, all of that stuff. And as Megan mentioned, uh, next month we'll be talking about uh, preserving food and putting food by. So hopefully you'll be able to join us then. <laughs>